Okay, the second industrial revolution. If you remember, the first industrial revolution happened in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. The first industrial revolution depended on steam as a new form of power. It led to factories and, of course, the growth of cities. The second industrial revolution is a revolution in steel, communications, power, and business practices. Some of the most important men back then, for example, Andrew Carnegie, he used a process called the Bessemer process to turn iron and superheat it and add additional chemicals to it to produce steel. Steel was stronger, steel was cheaper, steel could actually be bent more rather than iron, and so he formed the largest corporation at the time called U.S. Steel. Andrew Carnegie was a fabulously wealthy man. He then went on to use his wealth to form, to start universities, to uh, start libraries and various other things because he had the idea that even though he was rich, he still had a responsibility to other people. Another one, John D. Rockefeller, uh, took the, the discovery of oil in Pennsylvania in the 1860s and he, through his business abilities, he built a petroleum company by the name of Standard Oil. And they were able to turn this petroleum into multiple different things, gasoline, kerosene, lubricants, uh, and oil and things like that. It led to the end of the whaling industry, which is probably a good thing. But Standard Oil is now known as Exxon Corporation, still one of the largest corporations in the world. A gentleman by the name of Cornelius Vanderbilt. Cornelius Vanderbilt got his start in shipping and running oyster boats, believe it or not, around Long Island Sound. But he realized, he realized eventually that there was more money to be made in railroads. He formed the New York Central Railroad and was one of the most wealthy men in America because he kept buying other small railroads. He actually got his start not by purchasing a railroad, but by purchasing a bridge which crossed the Hudson River into New York City. As soon as he bought the bridge, he then forced the railroad companies who were wanted to use that bridge in order to get into New York City to sell to him. Cornelius Vanderbilt and his children went on to form, for, uh, for example, uh, Vanderbilt University and then also uh, the Biltmore Mansion, which is in Western Carolina. Probably the richest man was a guy by the name of John Pierpoint Morgan. John Pierpoint Morgan, also known as J.P. Morgan, he founded a banking house. It was called the House of Morgan. And he personally lent the United States government enough money to stop an economic panic in 1890 his money. He was that wealthy. All of these men became the first billionaires in American history. Now that's when a billion dollars was a lot of money. Okay, And this was called the Gilded Age because when these men, except for Carnegie, these men were so fabulously wealthy that they built them and others. They built huge mansions and houses in all the very important neighborhoods in New York City and Philadelphia and various other places. They were fabulously wealthy and they used, most of them used their wealth very well. Okay, now, these, this, the second industrial revolution was also a time of incredible inventions. And these men made some, some inventions that are very common even today. A guy by the name of Thomas Edison, he figured out a way to make uh, electricity commercially available. Because of that, he invented light bulbs. And then he invented cameras, movie cameras. He then invented something that we, that people of my generation would call a record player, right? Recorded sound so that you could play it back. He formed a corporation called RCA, the Radio Corporation of America. Another guy, Alexander Graham Bell, invented the telephone. He then went on to found the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, AT&T. You see their advertisements on TV all the time. A guy who we're not very familiar with, Christopher Scholes, invented a typewriter and the, he also invented an adding machine. This led to a company called NCR, National Cash Register, which ultimately became IBM. Another guy, Charles Eastman, invented a camera. Now, in the old days, the cameras they used on the Civil War battlefields were very big and very cumbersome and used a lot of chemicals. And he figured out a way to do it cheap, and he formed a company called Kodak. I'm not sure they're still in business because electronic cameras have kind of made what he did obsolete. Got a guy named Elijah Otis. 
He did not invent elevators, but he invented the brake, which stops the elevator, and he formed a company called Otis Elevator Company. If it weren't for him, they wouldn't have been able to build skyscrapers, because who in the world is going to walk up a hundred flights of stairs? But with an elevator, you can do that. And probably the most, one of the most important men on this is Henry Ford. Yes, the founder of Ford Motor Company. What Henry Ford did was he took a, the concept of an assembly line. An assembly line, before Henry Ford, teams of men made a car individually by hand. And the assembly line idea is that you had a bit of the car and it kind of rolls by on a conveyor belt and one guy puts one part on and that's all he does. The car moves over, the next guy puts another part on, the next guy puts another part on, the next guy puts another part on, and at the end of it you have a fully built car so he could use unskilled workers to build his cars. But because he was a brilliant businessman, he actually paid his workers enough money to buy the cars they made. Because of that, by the year 1917, he had sold four million automobiles. And finally, with a North Carolina connection, the Wright brothers, Wilbur and Orville, although they grew up and did a lot of experimenting in Ohio, they flew the first airplane flight in the history of humanity in Kitty Hawk Island, the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Very important inventors. Now, one of the other changes was changes in business and how businesses were organized. And this is going to sound a little economic, so kind of work with me. It used to be that if you started a business, you were the sole owner. And that started to convert to what are called stock companies. So what a sole owner does is he will sell something called stock in order to raise money. Maybe he wants to build a new factory. Maybe he wants to you know, hire more workers. He needs money. Now, instead of going to a bank, he sells stock. And what stock is, is a percentage of ownership in his business. Because of that, the people who buy the stock get a percentage of the profits. And they also have a very low risk if the business fails because he's not losing all his money personally, but all the stockholders might lose a couple of bucks here and there. Now, when an owner converts from sole ownership to a stock company, it changes into a corporation. And the business entity known as a corporation then owns the business, and it's abbreviated C-O-R-P, Corp. Now, a corporation is run by a group of men called a board of directors. They make all the big decisions, and they also pay officers for the day-to-day -day running of the company. So this is how a corporation is organized. Now, the purpose of a corporation is to do this maximize profit because they want to make as much money as they can so they can pay their officers a lot of money and so that they can pay the stockholders a lot of money. The way a corporation maximizes profits, they do it in several ways. First, they try to eliminate competition. Second, they try to cut the cost of production because you have to pay your workers some wages and then you have to pay for the materials for whatever they're making your product out of. So they try to cut the cost of production. They also sometimes try to conspire with other corporations to set price. Because if they, if all the corporations say that are making school chairs all decide that they're going to sell a school chair for 25 bucks a piece, then that's the price you're going to pay. And that's what's called setting price also corporations to maximize profits. They buy off politicians. They pay off politicians in order to get laws passed that benefit the corporation. Now, sometimes the corporation gets big and it's called a monopoly and it's not really the game, although there's an interesting tie-in to the game. Here's what a monopoly is. A monopoly is a corporation that is the sole provider of a service or a product. Nobody else makes them just that. Think of what it would be like if there was only Apple computers, if there was no PCs and no Microsoft. Apple would be a monopoly. Now, monopolies are great for business and they're good for stockholders. Why? Because there's no competition. And no competition means they can set their prices wherever they want, and that's what you're going to pay if you want to buy one, because there's no competition. You can't go down the street and buy an IBM computer because nobody makes them. There's only Apple. They are not good for consumers, which of course is us. Two kinds of monopolies, a horizontal monopoly, and the easiest way to think of this, think if there was only Toyota. 
That's the only cars that are made, the only trucks that are made. No Ford, no GM, no Hyundai, no Mercedes-Benz, no Lamborghini, only Toyotas. That's called a horizontal monopoly because they control everything dealing with cars. Then there's what's called a vertical monopoly. A vertical monopoly is when the corporation owns everything from the raw materials they make it out of all the way up to the store they sell it at. The perfect example is Carnegie's U.S. Steel Corporation. U.S. Steel owned the coal mines and the iron mines that they dug out of the ground. They owned the mills, which would actually produce the steel. They owned the railroads, which would transport the stuff from the mines to the mills, and the railroads would transport the things from the mills to the people who would use the steel. Steamship companies, construction companies, and in fact, railroads, because railroads needed the steel to make the tracks their trains would run on. So not only did he own the railroad for transportation, the railroad was his best customer because he could sell them the rails. Now, these are monopolies. The purpose of a monopoly is to control the market so that you're the only person selling it and no one else can get in to sell. And sometimes that can't be done. And that's then what business will try is what's called a trust. If a monopoly is not possible, then the board of directors, you know, the guys who run the company, the board of directors serve in multiple corporations. So that you have, say, 10 board of directors that work in one company, and this guy also works in this company, and that guy is on that board of directors, and this person is on that board of directors, and that person is on this board of directors, so that all of them work together. Cooperation between corporations. Why would they want to cooperate? To set price, nah. to control the competition, to buy political influence, because they want to maximize profit. Now, that's the business side. What does business actually need? Corporations need workers. Okay, and at this point in time, turn of the century, late 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s, the workers were Americans and immigrant labor who came in from Eastern Europe. And they were horribly abused by monopoly and the trust because of the political power that monopolies and trusts had. The monopolies didn't have to pay them any real money. You know why? There's nowhere else to go to work for. And so you get paid what they feel like paying you. And dangerous workplaces. Why should they spend the money to make it safe? It's not like the workers are going to quit and go down the street to work in another factory because there ain't no other factory. Injured workers were usually fired. Now, the workers try to organize. Remember when I talked to you about the, the, the cattlemen and the farmers and they tried to organize in the Grange and the Farmers Alliance? Well, workers tried to organize too. And one of the first big labor unions, because that's what they are called, was called the Knights of Labor. Now, the Knights of Labor had an interesting way to do things. They would take all workers, any skill at all, and they would include women and African Americans in their labor unions, and that was very different at the time. They tried to get power in order to influence businesses. They tried to seek power through public support. They would have rallies, they would have marches, and it all went bad at something called the Haymarket Riot. Now that's in New York City. And there was a huge demonstration of the Knights of Labor and there were cops everywhere. Well, some person, probably an anarchist from the Knights of Labor threw a bomb at the cops and blew up and killed like six or seven of them. And in return, the cops opened fire and killed 30 or 40 of these people from the Knights of Labor. Now, the public opinion began to turn against these people because they thought they were anti-government anarchists kind of like the Occupy Wall Street people. And so they kind of, they went down. The next people that kind of came up was called the American Federation of Labor, called the AFL. Now these people did it different because they only wanted skilled workers, um, engineers and, and iron workers and people who could build things, not just unskilled people. And that usually meant only white workers too. They used strikes. Now what a strike is, is when all the workers decide, I'm not going to work today, to heck with that. And they just don't do any work. And so the company has no one to make their products. And eventually the company has to negotiate 
with the workers. And that's what they wanted, strikes in order to force negotiations so that the business would have to pay the workers more money. One very famous one was called the Pullman Strike. Now, Pullman made railroad cars, and the workers, the FFL workers at Pullman, they went out on strike, and then all the railroad workers went out on strike in support, and what that did was it stopped the railroad. Now, at that point, you'd think that Pullman would kind of give in and give the workers what they wanted. The government stepped in, and they sent the army in to bust up this strike, to break the strike and break some heads too. You see, back then, during the Gilded Age, the trusts and the monopolies were very powerful when it came to political power, and so the government supported the corporations and not labor. And that's just not fair. And that was going to have to change through the next large political movement called the Progressive Movement. More on that later.